Upstate Medical University in Syracuse, New York invites you to be the informed patient with the podcast that features experts from Central New York's only academic medical center. I'm your host, Amber Smith. Today, I'm speaking with a scientist who studies retinal disease at Upstate. William Spencer recently received a grant from the E. Matilda Ziegler Foundation for the Blind. He's an assistant professor of ophthalmology and visual science at Upstate. Welcome to The Informed Patient, Dr. Spencer. Thank you for having me. You've done research on progressive rod cone degeneration. Can you explain what that is and and why you're studying it? Yeah, so progressive rod cone degeneration is uh, a disease that was originally discovered in the 1970s in dogs. Um, It's actually the most common cause of blindness in dogs. And since it was discovered, has been discovered in just about every different uh, type of dog you can imagine. So well over 40 different dog breeds are affected by this disease. And it was studied uh, by Dr. Gustavo Gure at University of Pennsylvania uh, for decades. This disease was in in the dog. He's a a veterinarian and a, a scientist. And he uh, eventually mapped the disease to a single mutation in a gene that he named PRCD after the disease. So the gene, it's a codes for a protein, is called PRCD. And each letter of that gene name stands for progressive rod cone degeneration. So it was. You know, it was mapped in 2006, so that's when he found this, discovered this new gene. And at the same time, he found that this exact mutation and others is present in humans that are blind and having the disease in humans called retinitis pigmentosa. Uh, And so I'm studying this because there's very little known about the protein. And that's kind of my area of expertise is understanding the function of a novel protein. What does it do? How does it work? Uh, and in, in the effort that we could understand a little bit more about the photoreceptor cell and maybe develop new therapies, including for this disease, progressive rod cone degeneration. So this is really pretty recent, at least in, in humans. Yeah. So you mean the discovery of the, the discovery of, of right. the gene that causes yes. this? So wow. yes, it was probably one of the, the most recent. And the reason for that probably is that this particular protein in the gene that it codes for this protein is very small. It's extremely small. It's only um, six kilodaltons. So your average protein, let's say, is, is closer to a hundred kilodaltons. So it's, it's just a very small protein and that probably made it difficult to detect biochemically in the early days of studying photoreceptor cells because it was just so small. Well, can you tell me what the symptoms of PRCD are and are they the same in humans or do we know if they're the same in dogs as well? So... In dogs, you know, it was named progressive rod cone degeneration because there is the progressive death of rod photoreceptors followed by cone photoreceptors. And so this is essentially exactly how the disease develops in humans. You have this progressive death of rods followed by cones. So in a human, you have 100 million rod photoreceptors and about 5 million cone photos. And most of the cones are in the center of the retina in a region called the macula. And so because you're kind of losing the rod photoreceptors first, those are primarily on the periphery of the retina, kind of on the edges of the retina. So the symptoms would be that you get tunnel vision slow, so you lose your peripheral vision over time, and then eventually you lose your vision completely. And so this is, you know, very similar in, in the dog and in the human. 
these these symptoms. Is it treatable at this point? No. So there is no treatment whatsoever for retinitis pigmentosa right now, including retinitis pigmentosa that's caused by mutation in PRC. So there's no treatment for progressive rod cone degeneration in the dog or this the same disease in the human. Can you tell us what you've learned about this condition through your research? Yeah. So I mentioned rod and cone photoreceptors. So maybe, you know, some of you have heard of, of rods and cones. The rods are, you know, used for kind of nighttime vision and cones for uh, daytime vision and cones. There's, you know, humans have three different types of cones. You have red, green, and blue. And they're like the pixels of your retina that enable you to see colors. Okay, so they're called rods and cones because of the structures that are attached to these cells called the rod and cone outer segments. Now, the outer segments are these, they're basically antennas. They're uh, essentially gigantic cylinders that are filled with these disc-shaped layers of membrane. Membrane, of course, is like the skin of the cell. It's like a lipid skin of the cell. So you have this big cylinder that has layers and layers of this lipid membranes. And these, these lipids, this, this membrane material serves to contain photopigment protein. So this is protein that absorbs light. And by putting, uh, you know, this photopigment in a big cylinder and packed with layers and layers of this photopigment, this enhances the sensitivity of your vision. So your rod photoreceptors are capable of detecting one photon of light. So that's as sensitive as, as they could be. And much of that could be attributed to this humongous light sensing structure, this outer segment, and the arrangement of those membrane layers. Now, what we found, uh, sorry to preface that with a long-winded story, but what we found is that this PRCD protein is specifically residing in that outer segment structure, in that light sensing structure. So it was previously unknown where this protein was or even what cell type it was expressed in. So we found that it is in the photoreceptor cell and specifically in the outer segment. And we also found that the mutation in the protein that causes blindness in humans and dogs causes this protein to be mislocalized from the outer segment to other cellular compartments throughout the photoreceptor cell. So this blindness causing mutation is preventing the protein from reaching its hole in the outer segment. And what that really means is that this little protein has some essential function in the outer segment. It's doing something there that's important for vision. So what is it doing? Well, we made a genetically modified mouse mice are uh, a tool that we use to understand how genes work. And there's a lot of kind of tools that we can, we can do with mice, which is why they're a good uh, model system. And so we made a genetically modified mouse that doesn't have PRCD protein at all. This was a great tool for us to look at, okay, what is PRCD doing? Well, let's just remove it and see what happens to the cell. Well, without PRCD, the light sensing outer segment cylinder structure starts having some issues. Now, as I mentioned, the outer segment structure is packed with all of these layers and layers of disc membranes. They're, they're shaped like pancakes. So imagine a big cylinder that's filled with pancakes. And over time, light is kind of damaging these membranes. So the photoreceptor cells continuously replacing those uh, discs. So every day, each of your photoreceptors builds 100 new photoreceptor disc membranes. 
this is just a, a very demanding task of the photoreceptor cell, but it's doing it every day for the rest of your life and each of your photoreceptors. And these disc membranes are formed at the bottom of the, the giant cylinder. That's where they're added. So they're each, you know, pancake, so to speak, is, is added to the bottom of the stack. And what happens if you don't have PRCD is that the discs, as they're being added at the bottom, start to partially fragment. So some of that kind of material is shed into the space surrounding the cells. So instead of going into the cylinder, it's kind of like a, a leaky faucet where you're spilling some of the guts of this light sensor throughout the extracellular space. So this is perhaps what we think is causing the death of photoreceptors. There's all this membrane junk that's accumulating around. And in other neurological diseases, when you have membrane junk accumulating around neurons, this is toxic for the uh, cells. And for some reason, it's not really understood why that is, um, but that's where we are. And so that's what we know about PRCD in a nutshell. Well, let me ask you, does our body's immune system help clear out that membrane trash that needs to get removed? Yes, that's a good question. So, um, yes, what we found in, in the mouse, for example, that doesn't have PRCD. This was also observed in dogs affected by the disease. That the retinas, resident immune cells called microglia, uh, kind of migrate to that outer segment layer where, uh, you know, all of these light sensors are located in the retina and they start to kind of engulf and clear and eat those fragments of those disc membranes. Clearly the response of these microglia cells is insufficient. They aren't able to clean up all the junk because it's accumulating, but it does appear that the, you know, the retina does have some capacity to know, Hey, this is bad. We need to do something about it. Let's bring in the garbage trucks, and try to clean up the junk. Um, but, you know, it's, it's possible that by doing that, that those cells are causing collateral damage, those microglia, they're trying to clean up the junk, but they could be damaging the photoreceptors in the process. And that's, um, will be a part of my research moving forward. This is Upstate's The Informed Patient podcast. I'm your host, Amber Smith. I'm talking with Dr. Will Spencer, an assistant professor of ophthalmology and visual science at Upstate. And we're talking about his research into progressive rod cone degeneration. Now, the grant you received recently is directed at your research into the role ectosomes play in retinal disease. What can you tell us about ectosomes? Ectosomes are small membrane vesicles. They're like little bubbles, like little, as I mentioned, those disc membranes, they fragment. Well, when you have a membrane structure that breaks into a smaller membrane structure that's released outside the cell, it uh, typically will be round. Just like if you blew a soap bubble, it's round. It wants to be round. And these small little round membrane structures, if they're released straight out of the cell, they're called ectosomes. And so actually in the case of, if you don't have PRCD, for example, in the mouse that doesn't have PRCD, that membrane junk that's released coming off those disc membranes, those are ectosomes. Now what's, you know, really kind of fascinating is that a few years ago, we found that the photoreceptor cell is kind of building its light sensitive structure adapting machinery that normally produces these vesicles. This is kind of confusing, but let me, let me just explain. So 
the photoreceptor's outer segment, this giant cylinder, is actually a specialized type of antenna that's present on basically every cell in your body called a cilium. So just about every cell in your body has this kind of antenna-like structure that can do different sensory things. It just happens to be the light sensor of the photoreceptor. And it's recently been appreciated that cilia have this innate ability to release little ectosomes from their membrane that can serve a range of functions from removing unwanted protein to cell to cell communication. And what we found is that the photoreceptor cell also has an ability to release these little ectosomes, but the photoreceptor cell has evolved to block that process. So normally the ectosomes are not released because the photoreceptor cell expresses some very specific machinery that instead of allowing that vesicle to release, that vesicle, it, it buds, but it's retained at the membrane. So it's kind of like it's, it's hanging on like a hanging chad or something. And that is the source of building material for building those disc membranes. So in other words, the photoreceptor cell is a hair split away from instead of building its light sensor to releasing all of that membrane material in the form of a vesicle, an ectosome. So why does the photoreceptor hold on to these ectosomes? Are the ectosomes seen as not being helpful or are they seen as being no, helpful? It, through evolution, uh, usually when a new mechanism is needed by a cell, it's not going to reinvent the wheel. The cell will usually take some other machinery and adapt it for a different function. So the core machinery is ectosome release. Maybe I shouldn't say ectosome release, but ectosome construction. So it's building the ectosome. So um, so what role do you think ectosomes play in retinal disease? There's actually a number of different cases, not just PRCD, where the photoreceptor cell releases these ectosomes. And uh, in all cases where the ectosomes start accumulating, this is promoting retinal disease. Well, we don't actually know if it's directly promoting disease or not but it's associated with disease. And cases that have more ectosome accumulation typically have faster retinal degeneration. So, you know, probably the ectosome are toxic to the retina. This is membrane material that's kind of accumulating in the retina. And as I mentioned, when you have membrane mem material that's accumulating around neurons. This is generally not good for neurons. Um, for example, in multiple sclerosis, when you have kind of your axons, uh, that are, uh, wrapped with membrane called myelin and this myelin starts degenerating and fragmenting and accumulating around the axons. This is causing problems resulting in disease. Um, so my hunch is that the ectosomes are not exactly a, a good thing and that this is a defect in building the outer segment. So when you have a defect, it, certain types of defects in building the outer segment are leading to the release of these vesicles, because as I mentioned, the photoreceptors really just hair split away from instead of building that outer segment. Uh, it wants to release it all as a vessel, a vessel. And that, I mean, maybe I can put this in perspective. So each of your outer segment, your white sensing structures is cute. It's, it's packed with 1000 disc membranes. If you actually unfolded all of those disc membranes in one of your retinas and just like laid it flat, it would cover, uh, the surface area of about the size of a large beach towel. So that just kind of tells you just how much membrane there is. And it has to be folded and perfectly packed. The whole point of that is to maximize the efficiency of photon capture. 
to make your vision sensitive. And if it's not packed correctly, for example, it's being partially or fully released in the form of these vesicles, this is creating a mess. And as I said, you're building a hundred new discs every day. That's the size of a piece of paper, approximately. So you're generating tons of this membrane constantly. It needs to be a well-oiled machine. And uh, that membrane has to be packaged nicely. And if it's not, then this is causing disease. Well, Dr. Spencer, before we wrap up, I want to ask you what attracted you to the field of science in general and then how you ended up in ophthalmology and visual science. So I guess maybe I'm a, I'm a nerd at heart. My, my dad was a chemist and kind of always wanted me to be a chemist maybe, or, you know, kind of introduced me to it. But at a young age, I remember we were, um, I was in grade school and we were at a, 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 an auction where you could walk by and put down, and there was a microscope, like a, something you would find in a high school biology lab. And my dad was like, oh, that's a nice microscope, you know, and he put down a hundred dollars thinking that was like a $500 microscope. And turns out that he won the bid and he was almost like grumpy that he won, which I thought was funny. Um, but I, you know, at a, when I was in grade school, I got this nice microscope. I mean, you know, for a grade school kid, it was, a, it was a cool one. And I just remember, you know, putting pond water on there and looking at little rotus moving around. Like I was just captivated at a young age by that, even though he wanted me to be a chemist, you know, I guess it's sort of his faults that I. I just felt like biology was so interesting. And I had excellent high school biology teachers. They were just superb. So as a visual science researcher, do you believe there's a cure for blindness waiting to be discovered? Yes, I think there's, you know, some serious progress. I think it's an optimistic future. It's, it's really, um, there's some amazing breakthroughs that have happened. So, you know, with CRISPR and gene editing, there's a thorough testing process for therapies to make it as an, a, a real treatment. And the retina is really at the forefront of uh, gene therapy. And, you know, this, for example, could be a very promising treatment for cases of retinitis pigmentosa, including PRCD. Uh, you know, PRCD is, it's really about not having that protein in that light sensing structure. So that's what the, the mutation is causing. It's causing the protein to be mislocalized. So if we just put back the protein that no, has the normal, the correct sequence, this probably would rescue the degeneration. It's actually a slow degeneration. So if this could be recognized early, then you know, gene therapy could be developed more. And as we get better and better at it, this is something to be excited about. Do you think that clinical trials would involve dogs before they involve humans, since this is a disease that affects dogs too? It certainly could. Yeah. There's, I've heard estimations of, you know, uh, tens of thousands of dogs in the United States that are blind from uh, PRCD. Uh, I guess the one challenge is that Typically, you don't know if the dog has until it's already kind of severely has a degenerated retina, at which point the gene therapy wouldn't work, really. The photoreceptors are already, are, are already gone. Um, but this could be tested in the mouse and it worked out there wow, very nicely. Well, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Spencer. Yep. Thank you. My guest has been Dr. Will Spencer. He's an assistant professor of ophthalmology and visual science at Upstate. The Informed Patient is a podcast covering health, science, and medicine, brought to you by Upstate Medical University in Syracuse, New York, and produced by Jim Howe. Find our archive of previous episodes at upstate.edu informed. This is your host, Amber Smith, thanking you for listening.